Hey everyone, my name is Lev and this is the second video in a series documenting my progress building a 1970s computer out of discrete transistors. It's been a month since my last video and the computer has progressed quite significantly. So far, I've only finished the program counter and the stack pointer. To test these components, I've hooked up the data and address buses to an Arduino Mega, where I've coded a basic emulator. Essentially, the Arduino is pretending to be the rest of the computer, so it simulates the ALU, the registers, the memory, etc. I wrote a little assembly program to perform division, so let's see how that works. First, I'll hook up the Arduino to the serial port of my laptop. And then once we connect power, it starts printing text. I'll enter in a precision of 10 decimal places and we're ready to divide. Let's compute the fraction 355 over 113, which is one of the convergence to pi. As you can see, the fraction is accurate up to 6 decimal places. Let me try getting more precision. I'll restart the program and enter in a precision of 100 decimal places. Now if I try calculating, say, 22 divided by 7, it will print out the first 100 digits of the decimal expansion. You get the idea. Let's restart again and go back to the faster 10-digit precision mode. What happens if I enter in a big number? As you can see, the program catches it and prints an overflow message. Similarly, if I try dividing a number by zero, I also get an error message. All in all, this is a pretty useful little program. You might wonder if we can run it any faster, but unfortunately the maximum speed is about 4 kilohertz. This is entirely the fault of the Arduino, since it can't run the emulator code any faster than that. This is about 100 times slower than the maximal clock speed of the computer, so for now we'll have to run it at this limited speed. Even though most of the hard work is being done by the Arduino, I think this is still pretty cool. You might wonder how I got from building basic counters on breadboards to a 1000 transistor circuit capable of interfacing with a computer. The first step in understanding this process is to look at how logic gates are made out of transistors in the first place. The simplest type of transistor is the BJT, or bipolar junction transistor. In my project, I didn't use BJTs, I decided to use MOSFETs, or more specifically an N-channel MOSFET. A MOSFET is essentially a voltage controlled switch. There are three pins, the drain, the gate, and the source. The gate pin is connected to a small plate separated from the rest of the transistor by a metal oxide insulator. This plate can be thought of as a small capacitor. When this plate is charged at zero potential, practically no current can flow between the drain and the source. But when this gate is charged past some threshold potential, by the magic of semiconductor physics, current can now freely flow between the drain and the source. In practice, things aren't this perfect. There are some annoying complications which we'll discuss in a future video. So how can we use such a transistor to make logic gates? Well, let's start with the simplest possible gate, a NOT gate. Here you can see I've drawn a simple, simple schematic and built a model on a breadboard. When the button isn't being pressed, the gate of the MOSFET is at zero potential, and so the output is being pulled high through the resistor. This turns on the LED. If we press the button, the gate of the MOSFET charges up, and the output is now tied low, via the lower resistance path through the MOSFET. This turns off the LED. So there we have it, a working NOT gate. This style of using MOSFETs as pull-downs is pretty similar to how microprocessors were made in the 1970s. Modern microprocessors and integrated circuits use mainly CMOS logic, which I may explore in a future video. We can use a similar technique to make a NAND gate. Here I've drawn a schematic and I've built a circuit on a breadboard. When both inputs are low, neither gate is charged, and so the output is tied high, just as we would expect from a NAND gate. If only one input is high, the output is still pulled high, because the pathway to ground is blocked. But when both outputs are high, the output is pulled low because there is a low resistance path to ground. With a similar circuit, we can make a NOR gate. Here, rather than connect the transistors in series, we'll hook them up in parallel. Testing the circuit, we can see that the output is only high if both inputs are low, just as we'd expect from a NOR gate. We can also combine these various components to form more sophisticated gates. For example, it's clear how we can make OR gates and AND gates, namely by inverting the output of the NOR and NAND gates, respectively. A more complex example is an XOR gate. This gate outputs high if only one input is high. Pause the video and see if you can understand how this gate works at the transistor level. With these examples out of the way, let's actually start assembling the program counter. If you will recall from the previous episode, the program counter is a 16-bit register which points to the current instruction which the computer is executing. It can jump to the next location of memory, or it can jump to a specified location. It can also output its data onto either the data bus or the address bus. Let's break this component down into four parts. 
The data register stores the actual data of the program counter, so the address it's currently pointing to. The incrementer gives us the next memory location, so it adds one to the state of the program counter. The jump multiplexer allows us to choose between either jumping to the next location or to a specified jump location. And the bus interfaces allow us to output the state of the program counter to the address bus and the data bus so that the rest of the computer can interface with the program counter. Let's start with the data register, which takes up the majority of total transistors. The way we'll store memory in the program counter is a D-latch. Here's a D-latch built on a breadboard next to the schematic diagram. A D-latch has an input, an output, and a clock line. When the clock line is low, it doesn't matter what the input is, the output won't change. But as soon as the clock line is brought high, we can see that the output now equals the input. When the clock line drops low, the output is latched. As before, we now can't change the output unless we pulse the clock again. It's pretty clear how the circuit could be useful to store memory. An issue with this is that when the clock is high, there is a direct path from input to output. We want the input stage to be separate from the output stage, so we'll link up two D flip-flops in series to form a master-slave D flip-flop. Of course, this means that we'll have two clock signals, but as long as only one of them is high at a time, there will never be a direct path from input to output. Next, let's build the incrementer. This is a combinational logic circuit, which outputs the input plus one. To add one to a binary number, we simply need a half adder, which consists of an XOR gate and an AND gate. These half adders have an input, an output, as well as a carry in and a carry out. Looking at the truth table, we can see that the half adder adds the carry in and input. Let's hook up 16 of these half adders to get a 16 bit incrementer. This means connecting the carry in of each stage to the carry out of the previous stage. But what should we input to the first carry in? Well, we can see that if the first carry in is high, the output is incremented. But if the first carry in is low, the output remains unchanged. We can now build a really simple counter. Let's hook up the output of the D flip flops to the input of the incrementer, and the input of the D flip flops to the output of the incrementer. Every time we pulse the clocks, the counter increments. If we don't want to increment the counter, we can disable the carry in. And now when we pulse the clock, the counter does not increment. But suppose we want to jump to a different address instead of incrementing. To accomplish this, we'll add a multiplexer to the input of the D flip flops. A multiplexer is a circuit which selects between two inputs. If the select line of the multiplexer is low, it'll select the first input, and so the counter increments as before. But if the select line is high, the multiplexer will select the second input, and so the program counter is set to the jump address on the next clock pulse. Finally, I designed some bus interfaces so that the program counter can write to the address bus or the data bus when it so chooses. We'll talk more about these in a future video. I went ahead and designed all these components in Easy EDA and ordered the PCBs from JLC PCB. Hopefully they can sponsor a future video. The layout is quite simple. To reduce the number of boards, I grouped logical components into groups of four. So I designed a 4-bit incrementer, 4-bit multiplexer, 4-bit master-slave D flip-flop, and 4-bit bus interface. I also added a separate LED line so that I could control the brightness of the LEDs using a PWM signal. This also means I can supply more voltage to the transistors in order to overclock the computer. I made a few minor mistakes. For instance, I forgot to add a wire trace between these two pins on the master-slave D flip-flop board. Another really frustrating and stupid mistake was when I realized that I had put all the transistors backwards on the interface board. Fortunately, the board still works. I just have to mount the transistors backwards. It took me a good 20 hours or so, but I finally soldered up all the components for a program counter. In total, I soldered over 1,000 transistors, so the computer is still less than 30% complete. Now, to prevent my computer from becoming a horrendous rat's nest of cables, I also ordered some custom perf boards and mounted all of these boards onto a backplane. I made sure the headers had extra long pins so that I could wire wrap the back. This looks pretty complicated, but the schematics aren't that bad. I sort of eyeballed the wire wrapping, so I'll have to draw a schematic if people are interested. The back of the board is still a rat's nest, but it's much more organized. To understand what's what, here is the data register, here is the jump multiplexer, the incrementer, and the bus interfaces. The top bus interface outputs to the data bus, and the bottom one outputs to the address bus. If we turn the counter on, we can see that the program counter is represented by the blue LEDs, the next jump address is represented by the yellow LEDs, and the red LEDs represent the various control lines. For instance, the clock and select lines and the D latches and multiplexers respectively. At the bottom, I added four 16-pin headers so that I can hook up ribbon cables. 
Over here, we have the address bus. This is the data bus, and here are the control lines. I don't think I'll need to use all four uh, headers for this panel, but I may need this many control lines for the ALU and control logic. Eventually, all the panels will connect to a central board, which will house the main interface panel. To summarize, here are the control lines we have so far. First, we have our two clock lines, clock one and clock two. Next, we can output the program counter to the address bus and to the data bus using PCAW and PCDW. We can set the program counter to what's on the data bus using PCDR. And finally, we can set the carry in so that the program counter increments on the next cycle using the PC increment command. Let's hook up the control lines to an Arduino so we can test the circuit. We'll make a loop where the clock is pulsed every 10 milliseconds. If we set the carry input high, the program counter will start counting. Now let's connect the address bus and data bus to the Arduino as well, so that we can read the state of the program counter and jump to a designated address. I'll write a simple function which reads all 16 pins of the address bus and returns a number. I'll also write a function which writes a number to the data bus. Let's suppose we want to reset at 100. So we'll test if we're at 100, and if so, we'll jump to 0. Once I upload this, we can see that the program counter now resets at 100. Let's also build a stack pointer. This is pretty similar to the program counter. We have an 8-bit register. This goes into a full adder, since we want to decrement as well as increment. The output of this adder goes into a multiplexer for jumping, and back into the register. The stack pointer never needs to output to the data bus, so we'll only need one bus interface in order to output to the address bus. I went ahead and soldered the boards up and added them to the backplane. Here is the multiplexer, the data register, the full adder, and the bus interfaces. To increment the stack pointer, we set the carry in high, and to decrement the stack pointer, we add 255, which does the same thing as subtracting 1. So if we look at our back at our list of control lines, we can see that we have a, new, a few new ones. The clock lines are shared between the program counter and the stack pointer, so we don't have to worry about these. Our new commands are SPAW, which writes the stack pointer to the address bus. We can decrement the stack pointer using SPDE, and this is the same thing as adding 255 to the stack pointer. And finally, we have SPIN, which sets the carry in to the stack pointer so that it adds one on the next clock cycle. We'll hook up these new control lines in the Arduino and edit the program counter loop so that it decrements the counter. As we can see, the counter begins to decrement. If we instead want to increment, we'll set the SPIN pin rather than the SPDE pin. Of course, it begins to increment. To bring this video full circle, let's load up the Arduino program that I had running at the start. I'm not going to trace through the division commit program because that would take too long for this short video. So instead, let's go through a simple hello world program. First, I'll set up the inputs and the output ports, which are hard coded into the Arduino. Next, I'll allocate some memory for a message. Here I've typed in a hello world, and I've also added a new line character and terminated the string with a zero. Okay, now at the start of the program, the message location is loaded into the accumulator, and the print message subroutine is called. Once the message has been printed, we'll halt the program by running an infinite loop. We should probably take a look at the print message subroutine, which is the most important part of the program. First, we'll allocate a word of memory in RAM for the subroutine to store the message index. Recall that my computer has no index registers, so this is needed. Since we loaded the message, in message address into the accumulator before calling the subroutine, we can store the accumulator data into this message index. Now let's begin our loop. We'll use the data at the message index as a pointer and load the data into the accumulator. This loads the first character of the message into the accumulator. If this character is zero, we've reached the end of the string, so we'll return from the subroutine. Otherwise, we'll output the character to the output port. Now we need to increment the pointer and print the next character. Let's load up the message index and increment the accumulator. Just for fun, and to fully test the stack pointer, I decided to make this function recursive. Since the accumulator is now pointing to the start of the message plus one, we can simply call the print message subroutine again. This will print the second character, then it will call a method to print the third, and so on until it reaches the end of the string, and pops all the way all the stack of subroutines. This is a terrible way to print strings, of course, since we waste both time and stack base by doing the silly recursion. But let's see if it will still work. I'll use a custom-made assembler to assemble this program and load it into the Arduino. Once I connect the serial port and turn on power, the computer prints Hello World. 
That was pretty fast. I couldn't really tell what was going on, so let's slow down the clock speed and try again. We can see that the stack pointer is decrementing every time a letter is being printed. This represents all the recursive function calls being made. Once the entire message has been printed, all of the return addresses are pulled from the stack, and so we can see the stack pointer quickly increment back up to 255. I think we can conclude that the stack pointer and program counter are working pretty well. So I think I'll wrap up the video here. You'll notice that I didn't really talk much about how non-ideal effects of transistors and how this impacts clock speed. The program counter and stack pointer can run quite well all the way up to 400 kilohertz, but I think the ALU and control logic will be a bit slower. So the final clock speed might end up being somewhere in the 200 kilohertz range. I'll save all this discussion for a future video on speed. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please feel free to ask any questions or give me any suggestions in the comments section down below. I've linked to a Google Drive folder containing all of the board schematics in the description, although I haven't fixed the bus interface board, so watch out if you want to build this yourself. These videos take me quite a while to make and edit, so I'll probably release episode 3 in a month or two. No guarantees there. I hope to have finished the accumulator register and the ALU by then, so the hardware part of this project will be more than halfway done. After that, I'll need to build the control logic and hopefully begin programming Tetris. So thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.